to better assimilate a portal of portals about all the data that's available uh, from the state uh, and related agencies to, have to businesses as well as to, uh, to residents. Um, enable employees to be more efficient. Uh, enable our citizens, our businesses to create value-added services. Um, leveraging some of the data I just mentioned. And then enable uh, citizens to be more involved in local government, right? I think a lot of that comes through even like the, the video channels that are set up for assembly meetings, for example, or the recordings. So that is, uh, and then being more transparent with what's available, what meetings are available, what data is available to residents. And I think if you live here in the Valley, uh, you see a lot of that comes through with our GIS platform that, uh, that Eric and his team have developed over the last several years and uh, improved upon uh, quite a bit. My property, parcel viewer, um, a lot of uh, GIS applications that you haven't seen yet on the Open Data platform. Uh, you can kind of see if your flood zone is either permanent now or not on a little slider to see that. I look at my house, I used to be a flood zone, now I'm not. Um, just because we have better LIDAR data that gives us better elevation data. And you can see that online. So in any event, I wanted to make sure that we have a baseline about what we're trying to accomplish with the smart communities and really exchange of information. The agenda today is uh, I'd like to go around the room, get a few introductions, and then uh, Eric is going to uh, kind of share particularly the impact of a cyber attack on their open data platform and their GIS applications, a lot of which are up now, and a few that will still kind of, I think, come be complete through this month. Um, and then what that means for if you want to go now, find, begin, start consuming, consuming data again after that event. It was, uh, it was uh, probably the most tra traumatic technical event for the Matsu Burrow, as far as I know, uh, in years. Um, so he'll provide, provide that information. We have Grace, that's going to present some information on a new uh, since we're a, a information portal available to uh, Alaskans um, about information about your communities. It's, it's a, a bit of a, well, it's been around for years, but it's a phase two. And now I'll improve, and so I should be able to share that with you. We'll have a short break, and then we have our friends from uh, Gartner. And if you don't know Gartner, research and analytics uh, firm worldwide. Um, they do a lot of uh, client advisory and analysis work. And so uh, Tim Bloom will provide information about their views on what they call digital transformation. I know it's a $60 word that we talked about, but let's kind of break that down into some of the basics about what it is and how it applies to us. And then in the back of the room here from Dell is Chuck Locke. Chuck um, will talk more specifically about what Dell has for their smart cities and uh, technology platforms along the lines of digital transformation and uh, perhaps uh, provide some case studies in those. And then finally, we'll have a couple questions that we kind of talk about over lunch about what we're doing and how we're trying to resolve some of the some of the blockers in the work that we are doing. Okay, so with that, I'd just like to quickly go around the room. Um, we know who you are. Yeah, right. I'm uh, Eric White. I'm the uh, IT director here at the Matsu Borough. Hi, I'm Grace Bojean. I'm a resident analyst with the Division of Community and Regional Affairs, which is in the state of Alaska. I'm Joe Quickle, I'm a contract project manager out here at the Matsu Borough. Eric Dowdy, GIS manager for her. Uh, Amy McPherson, GIS analyst at the Matsu Borough Association. Uh, Eric Butterer, the manager of geospatial pro programs at the Alaska Railroad. Uh, Brian Kirby, the school district GIS. Sioux Valley today, which is closed, so Brian drove in. For, to be here with us. Um, Trish Zug, I'm with the Matsuburo School District also, and I do career and tech ed program administration. George Hayes, Deputy Borough Manager at the Matsu. Hi, Gillian Zugo with Dell EMC here in Anchorage, covering public accounts. Eric Emerton, I'm with Dell EMC, I'm the Alaska engineer. Susan Howard, Jazz, the Borough. Leah Jones, Matsuburo, I'm the chair of program. So, Michael Weinstein and GA with Surprise Comics. Jackie Kendrell, Corporate Communications at MTA. Lindsay Goldman here at the Ed Security at Alaska Railroad. Tim Bates, President of the CBL Business Management Group, and Adam Professor of Hobbington. 
Good morning, Deputy Partner, Mr. Partner. I'm Seattle. I support Partner. Amanda Kramer. I am the local leader at Partner. Dan Monarch, IG Operations Manager at Borough. Pat Chart, Pacific Health Coalition uh, Health Plan uh, and Health Service Delivery Consultant, and uh, also just uh, putting our phone in water for um, Environmental Services Consultant. Yeah, Andrew, Records Management Supervisor with FCA. Ashley Stein, Senior JS Programmer at Wikipedia. Rob Barnett, uh, Blue Development for Native Corporation. Margie Bob, IG. I'm just here to make sure that I have the right to make sure that the right to make sure that I'm going 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 to make sure we're picking up video over here. We're trying to pick up uh, audio, but we're having a little difficulty with audio right now. So we're going to try to get that uh, squared away if, if possible. Um, so for speak, speaking, we're going to see. This, this does seem to be working, huh? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All of a sudden, I got louder. That no, was a good. Thing. Uh, Mike, can you hear me in there? Okay. Is this good then? If we use this microphone? Okay. So we're going to uh, for the speakers. Today we will use the uh, try to use the microphone here, and I think that will uh, work out a lot better. And so for the rest of you that are, that are speaking, uh, <laughs> be careful. Uh, right over here, underneath, uh, there are some things that we can trip over. But luckily, I don't see our safety officer here this morning, so we might get away with it. Good. Well, good morning. Uh, again, my name is Eric White. I'm the uh, IT director here at the borough, and uh, for any of you that have been watching the news, you know that uh, we've had uh, quite a cyber attack uh, in uh, uh, late July. We were hit uh, pretty hard, and we've been in the uh, middle of a recovery. Um, we've also got an awful lot of uh, stuff going on, so I've got a, a big part of my team that's uh, out today at the AML in, in Anchorage. Um, yesterday, I spoke to a group in Anchorage. I've got uh, three of my team down in Anchorage talking about this event to uh, other groups uh, today. Uh, immediately after this um, event, uh, we're, I'm going to go back to Anchorage and speak to another group, and then we've got uh, more uh, engagements tomorrow and uh, Thursday as well. So uh, this um, cyber attack, uh, what, what happened and what we do to uh, recover from it and what we do to protect ourselves going forward um, has become uh, of great interest in our local community and, and across the U.S. There's quite a bit of uh, uh, cyber crime, cyber terrorism, call it what you will, but uh, there's a, an awful lot of going on and it's going to be a very, very important thing for us moving forward. It has obviously disrupted what we are doing here with smart communities. In smart communities, smart cities, our objective, of course, is to get information out to the public, put information that uh, we would have out in the hands of people that can do something wonderful with it and drive economic development, um, entrepreneurship, and, and drive growth. And of course, this kind of um, cyber attack disrupts that. So we, uh, we need to all be aware of what's happening, how it's happening, and how to protect ourselves. Um, I put together a few slides that I used at another event here just to kind of talk about um, a little bit about what happened. Um, talk about what happened, why it happened, the response, and what we've got to do to go forward. And I really just want to use uh, some of these slides as kind of a bit of talking point. If anybody has questions as we go, please feel free to, uh, to stop and ask questions on this. I won't go into quite the detail on these that I have in other uh, uh, forums. But uh, just briefly, it, this stuff is coming in via phishing. Uh, emails, they're getting more and more sophisticated. Uh, what the attackers are doing is they're attacking smaller organizations that have softer security. Once they get in there, they take over email, they watch that email, 
And when maybe another large organization asks for, for something from that small organization, then uh, they will use that email to respond to that request with the requested attachment, but now the attachment has, has a virus in it. And so these um, attacks are almost impossible to stop. Uh, this is email that we're expecting. So it's not uh, you know just a, a prince from uh, um, Saudi Arabia that wants to give you a million dollars anymore. It's not quite that obvious. It's uh, much more insidious. So uh, that's how it's coming in. And what we saw is that it got in. It uh, went undetected for a long time and uh, lay dormant, doing whatever they were doing. And then finally, in late July, they hit us with the uh, crypto locker or the ransomware. Uh, here at the bottom, we show the, the kinds of threats. You, you can see it was a multi pronged uh, attack, different kinds of malware, Trojan horses, uh, ransomware, uh, credential stealing. So these are all kind of the top threats uh, that are in the world right now. And uh, you have all of them. Uh, you see the, the note there says zero day. What that means is that these uh, threats morph. They change constantly. So as soon as you recognize them, they change again. And now your defenses don't recognize them anymore. So your antivirus uh, doesn't see it slip in. That's what happened in our case. And boom, it gets in and you get, uh, get locked up. And as soon as we found these viruses in our environment, and we send them back to the, the people that write the antivirus, anti-malware software. They update their software to catch this, this new threat, threat changes again. And that's going to be the way of our, of our future. This is happening constantly, and it's going to happen more and more rapidly. And so that means that uh, we have a larger and larger challenge to stay ahead of us. Um, one of the other uh, notes up here, theoretical exploit, of course, you know, what do you do when this kind of stuff hits you? You, you have a uh, backup system. That's, that's okay. You wipe everything clean. You bring everything back from backups and, and boom, you're back in action. Our backup system is supposed to uh, not be susceptible to this kind of attack, but there was something called a theoretical exploit. Well, it's not a theory anymore. Um, they got into our backups and, and crushed that as well. But luckily, through layers of security, layers of backups, our disaster recovery site and whatnot, we were able to uh, keep a lot of data uh, safe and get back on our feet. Um, we're talking a little bit about uh, why these things happen. Um, on the right side over here, you know, what, what are the attackers doing? What are they after? Well, they, they could be gathering data. Um, they could be simply looking to disrupt our, our operations. They certainly uh, disrupted ours. Or they might be looking for ransom. Or there might be some other uh, problems, but I think in this particular group, uh, the thing that's interesting is, is the data gathering. Uh, we found that uh, the attacks were largely centered in our GIS systems. And when you look at uh, your GIS systems, you say, well, what kind of data are they looking for? You know, we uh, in the Braille say, well, we, we make this, we have this data, and we make this data available publicly, so why would you attack our GIS systems? That doesn't seem to make any sense. Uh, but uh, we do know that there's players on, on a world stage here that uh, get into GIS systems looking for resource information. It could be gold or oil or other precious minerals or timber or whatever it happens to be. And uh, then they get into your financial systems and find out who's bidding on contracts that the government might be putting out to collect those resources and then they can. Uh, ascertain the, the, uh, the amount of resources that are there, how profitable it is, and then bid you know, $1 over the next bidder and get it at the lowest possible cost. So this is actually this is a real threat. And uh, this is a, a reason why they might attack an organization uh, like ours. Uh, certainly, any organization like ours that has uh, voting, uh, voting is another place where disruption is one of the aims of the attackers. They want to disrupt local government. The other uh, reason that they want to get in is they want to um, then use our organization to attack the next bigger organization. Federal government systems are very hard to get into. State governments also are. 
local government's a little easier. We have softer security in an organization like this, so uh, they, they attack us so that they can get uh, the bigger. Let me start looking at uh, you know why it happened on our side of the house. Um, our story in an organization of our type and size is the same story as, as there is across the nation. And that is, we are not staffed, we are not funded, uh, we don't have the experience to fight this kind of, kind of war. Uh, there is a um, certain amount of complacency, as I mentioned. All of our data is public. Why would you attack us? We, we make our data available, so what's, what's the point? Um, we're way out here in the middle of nowhere. Nobody's going to attack us, right? <laughs> well, um, when it comes to the internet, nobody's out in the middle of nowhere anymore. So uh, we are right in the mainstream of activity, um, even here. So we can't be complacent. We can't say it's not going to happen to us. Um, and so now we have to look to the, uh, the staffing and the funding. Uh, bottom line is we are outgunned in, in this war. The attackers are far more well-funded. They've been doing this for a long time. And uh, they can walk right through our defenses because we simply um, can't, can't compete with this. And so as we talk about going forward, the only way we're going to go forward is in groups like this. And we're going to have to get together and we're going to have to work together in order to stop the stress. We'll talk more about that. Any, any questions up to this point? Well, there are several, but I don't know that it's a good time to ask. I thought maybe you could go through your presentation and kind of cover some of the, some of the things at the end. Okay, sure. Okay, yeah, I've got, got a couple more things and then we can uh, do some questions. So uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, response here. Um, so this is a, a major incident like uh, anything else uh, that's a major catastrophe like a fire or a flood. You need to stand up incident response. You need to treat this like a disaster and you need to uh, uh, set up an operation center and uh, form teams and, and get after the problem. So that was one of the things that we did while we were here, and uh, one of the, the uh, things I've been emphasizing to the other groups I've been talking about is that um, in my position, was I hired to be an incident commander? Or for any of your organizations, your, your IT director, your IT manager, are, are you hired to, to do that? No, not necessarily. Is it, a, um, a, is it part of the job description? Is it a requirement for those uh, places? Not necessarily, no. If you have a person in a, in a position in your organization that can do this, that's great. But if you don't, at least recognize that and then bring in help. So when we, um, when we went into action here and we had this kind of um, an incident, we needed to stand up an operations center and, and do incident response and, and get after this. Uh, there are organizations out there that uh, can help you with this if you don't have the in-house expertise to handle a situation of this magnitude. And uh, so we we actually reached out to a, a company called SecureWorks, and they do this for a living, and they do it worldwide. And they came in with a team, uh, two um, IT security experts, and then a person who was an incident commander. And so what that person uh, will do is they'll come in and, and set up a structure for you if you don't already have one. And so, um, we, we went ahead and did that. We reached out, and we got a great deal of benefit from uh, that type of engagement. So uh, very important that if your organization is going through this, uh, don't feel that you have to handle it internally, because if you try to and you don't have the expertise in-house, it's just utter chaos. And so uh, get, get things under control quickly. Uh, project management, uh, as many as four or five project managers uh, in the office every day. I'm not doing a single project here. I'm doing a whole project portfolio. We rebuilt our entire network, a network that took us years to build. We're rebuilding the entire thing in a matter of a couple of months. Project management is vitally important. Don't skip that step. And then we, um, we did something else that we called minimum viable product. One thing I had to understand was um, my people uh, in, in IT are all, uh, we all, we all kind of think the same way. We're going to do something, we're going to do it right. We're going to do it right the first time. We're going to make it safe and we're going to have a nice polished product and then we're going to hand it to our users. That, that's why we like to do things. Those things take time. 
I also have users, I have users all over the world that need uh, something. Everybody is frightened, everybody is disrupted, everybody's not working, and so there's a lot of angst in the organization. We've got to give them something. And so what uh, we did is we stood up as much as we could, as quickly as we could, and a lot of it was very temporary. Uh, what is the minimum that I can do to give to my users to get them moving that then gives my team more time to build things the right way? So we started with phones, then we went to internet access, we got email, and we started standing up services little by little. We uh, didn't rely on all of the old ways of doing things, and that's where we had hosted most of our systems. We went to uh, cloud services like uh, Amazon Web Services, AWS, uh, where we could stand up a server in the cloud quickly and, and get some services back online. And so at, at each stage, we tried to give our users something and keep them working. And we've gotten feedback from our users that uh, said that that was absolutely vital uh, to our recovery because you have all these people sitting around in offices, can't work, can't serve the public like, like we're hired to do. And uh, every time we gave them something, it was, it was like Christmas. And, wow, well, okay, we got phones, we can start doing this. Oh, we got internet, we can start doing this. Oh, we got email, and we can start doing this. So even though uh, standing up these services wasn't perfect, it was, it was something, and it was good. So take care of your users. If you get into this uh, kind of a situation, uh, give your users something. Even though it's not the end result, give them something. We had a goal then here at Grow to uh, be back uh, kind of 95% functional by the end of September. And what I meant by 95% functional was users at their desks can serve the public. That did not mean that IT was done recovering, not, not by any stretch. In fact, we're still recovering. And we probably will be for, for quite some time. And when I say recover, we're not recovering back to where we were. We're recovering back to a place that's far more strengthened uh, than, than we were before. I can't bring us back to where we were because we got hit and we get hit again. So not only do I have to recover, but I have to <coughs> in, increase the building. So it's kind of like the, um, the big dad wolf in the field of pigs, right? You have the house of sticks, you got to blow them down. I got to build a house of bricks this time. And so um, we got the, we got the frame of the house up, we're living at it, and we got the people back to work, but now we've got to come back and lay all of those bricks and, and make our system, uh, um, uh, we got to strengthen that system. So we got to take care of our users, got to get them working, and then we got to come back and, and reinforce. And through all of this incident response, uh, probably one of the best things we did was communicate. Uh, this group met. Uh, right in the middle of this incident, uh, right? It was, was it August we met last time? And I talked about uh, what we were doing at the time. And so um, uh, we talked about this at that time. And then within our group, we've been communicating. You, you've seen us uh, communicating on the news. Uh, we put out press releases. Uh, part of that communication is necessary internally to my organization, but it's also important to everybody else. Part of the communication that we did, we got the word out quickly to other organizations about the kinds of threats we were seeing, and I've gotten a lot of feedback that uh, people have found those kinds of threats lurking in their own networks and were able to eradicate them before they get, get harder. So communication is extremely important during your incident. Okay, and going forward, um, again, communication is going to be the key. Uh, in an organization like this, I can't fight this alone. Organizations of this size, we can't. We have to be working in groups like this. We have to be communicating. We have to be helping one another. We have to rely on help um, from state and federal. And um, to be seeing the, the new emerging threats and figuring out ways to stop them. Because we're going to have more zero day attacks, more zero hour attacks. And we, we have to be talking to one another, or we're simply not going to be able to survive them. Um, as I look across this group, there's maybe maybe a couple of organizations in here that are big enough to, to be fighting this kind of stuff, but most of us are not. So we have to rely on that mission. 
So along those lines, um, one of the things that we have discussed, uh, uh, Doug puts on the um, uh, Alaska CIO Council meetings quarterly. We just had one of those last week or two, two weeks ago. Um, and so a bunch of folks in my position got together and talked about uh, how we solve this. And we have to have more regular meetings, more forums on specifically on cyber security. And so one of the uh, proposals that we talked about was taking this forum and adding an afternoon session. And in the afternoon session, we would specifically um, talk about uh, IT security. So again, this group this morning, what we're talking about is taking these great tools and this great information. <laughs> entrepreneurs and, and so on and then we could have an afternoon session that you could choose to stay for or or maybe different people would come in and we talk uh, very specifically about uh, uh, cyber security and so that's uh, one of the things that we're going to want to do uh, going forward there are some other uh, things already available like the CIO council I mentioned uh, InfraGuard is, is a local uh, organization that uh, you can uh, get involved with Department of Homeland Security, and they do webinars, and they send out alerts, and if uh, your IT is not subscribed to that, do so. Um, MSISAC is for local government support, and they'll send out alerts, and they have resources and, and tools available. So these things are, are extremely important for your organizations to be involved in. Uh, this is just uh, when they start looking at all the elements of cybersecurity in an organization, this is just kind of a big uh, um, brainstorm of, of what all that in, entails. And you can see that it's very big, it's very complicated, and you know, how, how do you even begin to uh, uh, work that in a small organization? It's very difficult. This is why it's going to be very important. Okay, I think... Uh, Time for a discussion here. I kind of like that one. Um, one. One last thing that I know Doug wanted me to, to talk about is a little bit of the um, uh, recovery here at the borough. Uh, for this particular forum, the things that we've been talking about are things like e-commerce and thing, things like open data, um, getting information out to the public. Of course, all of that was disrupted. At this point, we're almost completely back. Uh, back in action here. So we have recovered those things and uh, we are again serving the public with these systems. So e-commerce is, is back online and we got the swim lessons back online which make a, a lot of parents very happy that they don't have to go to the pool and stand in line mm -hmm. to sign up for swim lessons. Um, the uh, open data which is our GIS data and getting that out to the public that's almost all back online. During the incident, uh, we used a combination of um, ArcGIS Online, which is Esri's online service to provide a lot of this functionality. And now, as we're able to, we're moving some of those services back to our uh, infrastructure here in the building. Um, we have, I think, one last integration piece between our GIS and our e-commerce. I understand that it's ready, scheduled to go online later this week, but uh, might be up as early as the day. So, from a serving the public perspective, uh, we, are, we are back in action. And um, again, considering the uh, size and nature of this event, uh, I, we've done a really excellent job and I really want to uh, applaud my team for, for doing that. We have a lot of very smart people who work very hard and, and got this back up and running. And again, uh, and thanks to the rest of the community because as I look uh, around here a lot a lot of you and a lot of your organizations were here helping us uh, during this event so thank you very much so some quick questions uh to for the incident response, no, no, I did not have an RFP prior to that. So, right. Right. So, in our case, um, luckily we had some really great partners uh, that were that came in with these services and pitched them to us, and and our. 
under an emergency declaration, I was able to procure these services without going through the normal RFP process. So we did a lot of emergency uh, procurement to get this done. So I didn't have that in place, but that um, it's an excellent thing to have in place prior to this to know who you're going to call and who you're going to uh, bring in and how you're going to bring them in. So, and I would certainly be um, um, willing to help you with that with some lessons learned after the fact here. Mm -hmm. If I could paraphrase that with the with microphone here to the people that are listening um, outside. So absolutely, um, uh, we need to organize the people that uh, know how to do this, know how to stand up uh, incident response, uh, they have non-disclosure agreements already put in place. And uh, in, in a forum like this, we could start uh, working on that collectively where we could uh, get those things ready, know, know the who's who in the area that can roll in and help us for incidents like this. So I think that's an excellent suggestion. Thank you. Pat. Looks like, uh, Doug, you got a uh, microphone ready there so you can do questions on the... <laughs> it's a little button there that doesn't work in the official mode. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Well, yeah, kind of, uh, kind of interesting. I think maybe given enough time, they would have gotten everything we had. But um, the things that we found that survived this particular attack um, were databases that were open, active, and locked at the time. So the, the ransomware, the crypto lock, couldn't lock them. So as examples, our uh, records management system is an application server. And that application uses a... Uh, database, a SQL database, and that, that database file is open all of the time. And then it stores files that the database knows where to look for them, but it's not a normal shared drive that this particular kind of attack would know where to look for. And so with that database being open, it was not corrupted. And then uh, because those files were not in a normal file share kind of a, uh, an environment, uh, the, uh, the attackers didn't find them right away and didn't get after them. The other um, system that um, survived this was uh, SharePoint is our intranet and, and services some of our external web services. That again uses a SQL database, it's a database, and that database file is open. And so uh, the, uh, the crypto virus couldn't lock it because it was open, it was, it was locked to that kind of writing. So those uh, things survived. The other uh, major systems that we have, like our um, financial system, our camera system, uh, those things also survived because they were in databases that were open at the time, our GIS data. Um, the, uh, the original SD database, did that, uh, did that get locked, but we had copies of it? So that uh, application was shut down, and then those, um, those files were locked. So the, you know, the attackers knew this, and they were trying to shut down the applications that have these things locked but uh, didn't get to all of them before we found them and, and got rid of them. So those kinds of things uh, did survive. Yes. OK. 
Okay, good. Any other questions then? Joe's got a question. Yeah. Uh, so SecureWorks, um, we uh, we use a local company called GCSIT, and through GCSIT, they have a partnership with Dell, who's going to be uh, speaking here later today, and then SecureWorks is a subsidiary of, of Dell. So uh, through partner relationships that we already had uh, in place, uh, we were able to, to bring the teams in that were necessary. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right, thank you. We're pulling in the city clerk who kind of runs this room so we can get the video on screens on the wall as well as make these mobile microphones work. So um, so with that, next is uh, Grace. If you want to come up, Grace is with now. Are you actually specifically with DCRA, right? Okay. So you can go ahead and introduce. And... Paul Herrick. <laughs> Great. Um, good morning. I'm Grace Bojean. I'm with the Division of Community and Regional Affairs. Um, so if you're not familiar with that, it is a division within the state of Alaska underneath the Department of Commerce, Community, and Economic Development. Uh, we used to be our own department. Uh, we are constitutionally mandated to help and aid local governments in a whole facet of areas. Um, so our section itself is located within the Municipal and Community Policy and Research within DCRA. We have a lot of different sections within our organization that work to help communities in a multifaceted approach, um, be it with rural utility business advisory or land planning use. Um, we kind of sit as an umbrella to a lot of these sections that in our mandate is to help them in all capacities. So um, local capacity building, policy development, um, local government development. So we have a big mandate and we've been trying to maintain that through a, um, a kind of a community database online. Um, it's something that existed pre-online for back in the 80s and these really lovely kind of fold out handouts that people would take out to the communities with them that kind of gave a larger overview of things that we had. Um, and over the years, we've kind of migrated it into an Oracle-based uh, database and then to SQL. Um, and now we're kind of getting to the point where that SQL database is just it's broken. It's overly normalized. Um, we can't really maintain it. We can't put up-to-date information. And so we're trying to think, how can we do this in a much more holistic manner and actually put a place-based perspective um, concerning the fact that we really are dealing with communities on the ground and um, it helps the end user know where are these communities in relation to the state since it is such a large place. So we have a number of mandates that we kind of have to maintain as we were looking forward um, to this newer platform that we were going to uh, move towards. And that's how do we keep this information up to date. Um, right now in our old system, it takes almost a whole day just to update some fisheries data. Um, so what we were always doing was we were taking data much of which was we were not the authoritative source on. Um, as an agency, we, we do have some authoritative data, but not enough to really provide a holistic community profile. So we would reach out to different organizations and get their data. Um, sometimes it would be when they release it. Sometimes it would be a month or a quarter behind. Um, so that was really always a challenge for us. Um, and then how do we actually then take this data and get it into um, decision makers' hands? How can they use this to make on-the-ground decisions? How can they use this to do comparative analysis between communities? Um, we are really one of the first stops. We've heard a lot from people. I mean, some people maintain their own database, but we heard a lot from different state agencies. We're kind of the first place people go when they want to you know, they have an assignment to a community, to ANIAC. They've never been there. We're usually one of the first stops 
people go to see what kind of infrastructure is in place, um, what schools do they have there, is this a local government, do they have the capacity to do, um, is there a hotel for me to stay at, do I need to go and reach out to a school. Um, so really, we really wanted to be able to deliver these goals much better and stop a lot of our time is being spent on maintaining this clunky database, so we wanted to get back to research. We wanted to be able to do these larger analyses and tackle some of these bigger questions that are coming to us as a division, um, particularly as communities are facing the strange of state cutbacks, um, a general recession, job loss. So we wanted to be more effective in what we could do to actually service these communities and the larger population as a whole. So this is an example of our old community database online. Um, some of you might be familiar with it. Oh. This is an example of our own community database online. <laughs> um, so the state IT service has slowly been migrating over to a new look and feel. Um, so what we are seeing now is actually a market improvement from what it was maybe six months ago. Um, but it is still running behind the scenes on the same SQL database. Um, that our IT has come to approach us and just said, you guys need to migrate out of this. this. We, as a research team, we don't really control our database. There we go. Um, IT is the one who's doing it for us. And really, it's kind of a one-man shop, uh, given budget cutbacks. And for him, he's really excited for us to move to something better, because even from his own perspective, this is this is so broken that sometimes we get data updates and we can't even figure out how we've linked these um, things based off their unique identifiers. It's just so overly normalized. Um, but what it was, as a front-facing thing, it worked for some folks. Um, we were able to give you some data on all of the communities in Alaska that we've identified as either places of interest or municipalities or just um, census designated places. So over 400 places that we have data on um, to varying degrees depending on what's actually available. These are some of the larger data categories that we were able to provide data on. And again, notice a lot of it isn't necessarily authoritative to DCRA. So we get stuff from DED, um, from DOT, and also we do reach out to non-state agencies to get some of their data and try to host it up here. Census is a, um, working through labor as a representative, is a good partner of ours. And so this is that same community Ambler in the new format that we've gone with. So back in spring of 2016, I believe it was, we really took on this path and of finding a new direction to go. Uh, we had some consultants who came in and said, you know, I get what, you need something more iterative. Uh, it would be nice if you had something place-based and we can do that for you for 100 grand. And at 2014 was not really a feasible time for the state to shell out that kind of money. Um, so we actually, we had a, a GIS analyst within our division who worked mostly on um, Anxel and Platts, and we knew DNR was doing a big kind of utilizer of that for the State Department. So we went down to the Esri Users Conference in July and were pitched, you know, everything that you need we can do for you and we can really reduce that price tag. And instead of having the place-based scenario be one of your, maybe your third criteria, let's put that at the front and then everything else behind that can follow. Um, so we've started to use the community um, index and now putting it into these story map forums um, and we still have a lot of the same data categories, um, but it's a lot more interactive. 
uh, we actually can now include photos for the first time, which seems slightly silly that you, we would try to show people what a community is like with actually using visual representation of it. We can now add photos. We have audio files, which is really neat. Um, we also have the Alaska Native um, Language Preservation Advisory Council within our division who we work closely with. So we're now actually starting to take on this larger mandate that the state is putting forward to sort of normalize Alaska Native languages. So we can put in audio uh, files of place names and what that means. And we can start incorporating that into the community's overall profile to again normalize these languages. So for transportation, this is just a little segment of kind of how we've now decided to show it. Before, all we had was that little native block. And that came from, I'm guessing, DOT. Uh, but now we can actually pull in services and say, these are where the road systems are. These are who actually maintains your roads. Um, a, not necessarily a big question for smaller communities, but one that uh, we get a lot for some larger municipalities that have state and municipal uh, maintenance of roads. Where is the ferry system? And because a lot of this groundwork has been done by these other agencies, we're able to capitalize on that and show it exactly where they are in these communities. Um, and what's really great is that all of these are printable now. So the, we used, maybe if you wanted to print, you'd have to expand all those accordion files, and then you've got a couple of pages to go through. Now you can choose what section you want to print. Um, the maps are fully interactive up until the moment you hit print. So if you know that you're staying at the school um, and that you're kind of responsible for getting yourself from the airport to the school, you can kind of map out how it is that you're going to walk there or who should you flag down with their ATV driving by if it looks like it might be too long of a walk and it's January. This is going to be the new face um, and I guess I should suggest, mention that we are right now at the cusp of transitioning. Um, come January, we plan to take our old community database offline to the front end user. Uh, we'll still have it behind the scenes. But we're slowly going to start rolling this out. Software rollout will should be on our website within about a week. Within about two weeks, once you start, once you as a user go to the community database online, you'll be directed to this new format. Um, you, a lot of you might recognize this as the Esri Open Data Platform. Uh, we flirted with it for a while when it first came out, and we didn't really feel like it met our needs. But having them as a business advisor and the rate of growth that they have and their feedback with the end user, Within maybe eight months, they had a, a product that really was revamped to something that we could actually take and adapt and fit our general needs. Um, so right at the bat, you get to see where these places are. We, again, still have that list of communities if you want to just directly go to the community that you are interested in. Um, we're now actually able to even host data sets um, for places all across the state. So if you're looking for just a specific data set, you can go there too. Um, some of, again, we have the larger categories that we've always had, um, but now we're actually able to add more. So because this is running, we've, we've migrated to an SD environment, so because this is running behind the scenes in mostly tabular format, if some of our sections have tabular data that they forever have been kind of sharing out to the public just when requested, we can now take that, spatialize it, and put it out as a service that anyone can access through this platform. Um, and all of the data that we are putting out, we're putting out as feature services. And all of our rest endpoints, as long, for the most part, are being made public. Uh, we also, it's nice in terms for internal business needs. We can kind of have these uh, local dashboards to help us monitor some of the progress of some of our particular projects. But for the most part, all of these services are available through the rest endpoint. Um, one thing that because we're using now a GIS format, we've t capitalized on it by using this build your own data portal. Um, this is kind of twofold intended. One, it's kind of meant to normalize, I suppose, GIS for a non-GIS user. If you have no experience with GIS, you might just think of it as land use planning or resource planning. We're now taking school population data, and we can see that um, based off of symbology. So we're taking data sets that 
there's no reason why they shouldn't be spatialized. They traditionally aren't. So we're trying to get users to think about JS in a slightly different way than they were used to or never even had a conception of. So giving them the ability to pull in any of our services or any of the services that are already existing out there, you can pull that into this format and you can start seeing um, you know, what is the population in comparison to the revenue being, tax revenue being brought into a municipality, or what's the jobs in that community compared to, you know, the gross income for salmon fisheries. So you're able to pull in a lot of these data sets and layer it to, and symbolize it in such a way that you can now have this powerful image that you as a user can take and put into your PowerPoints and share with your um, stakeholders or with your partners or you can go and play around with in order to can take this and use it further as a research need. Um, all of our data is either available, like I said, as a feature service. It's also all downloadable just as a basic spreadsheet. Um, some people will only want to do that, and that's fine. Uh, that's something we were trying to think about in terms of not alienating some of our current users, but also bringing in new users and maybe kind of exposing them to something new, but still giving them that option to main, to go into this database the way they've always done to it, one place, and get the data and leave. Um, what's great now is you can come to it from a lot of different angles, and we're expecting that hopefully our users will find something that they feel comfortable with, and that no matter which way they're coming at the data, they're still able to meet their business needs. So our architecture, and I will admit I'm no um, system architect specialist, so bear with me. Uh, we went with the GIS Enterprise, so we have this SDE environment, um, and we have our staging environment in which we'll get the data that we used to have tabular and we'll clean it. Um, we've come up with certain protocols in terms of our schema. Um, we have a unique identifier for all communities. Um, and a unique identifier for all entities within those communities that we serve data on. Um, so we're actually able to, uh, we're, we're better able to either back in, a, in the SQL side of things, create larger visual views with a bunch of different data sets, um, but we're always able to somewhat relate things if the need is there. Uh, for the most part, we tend to serve out each of our data sets as their own um, service but we are still able to answer some of those larger questions and visualize data, able to do it in the background through our SQL environment. Um, we have a test environment and a production environment. Um, we have our local server, and IT is actually in the process of setting up a test server for us too. So kind of roll, before we roll out some new, uh, like Arc developer, before we roll out those things we can put into our test server. Uh, but data gets staged in the uh, testing side cleaned, we've got a number of scripts that we can run to get those unique identifiers immediately populated. Um, then we replicate it back up into our test production environment, and from the production environment, that's when we service out either onto our local server or for some of these higher performance uh, data sets that we know are going to get hit a lot, like the one on our main map or the one that are running those story maps. We've also pushed those to the cloud, um, and it sounds kind of listening for the past couple of months of what Matsu went through with it, it's also a nice way, you know, not if we get attacked, but if for some reason our, our server goes down for that day, we know that not everything, that entire platform is going to be gone down for equally long amount of time. It'll still be running up in the cloud for us. And then we can push it out as feature services and enable filters and query capacity on all that. So imaginably, we came up across a number of challenges as we were trying to figure this out. Um, a big one was how are we going to get the data that's already out there and pull it into here in a comp into our system in a comprehensive manner? And the thought was, since a lot of different agencies are also going to this SDE environment and hosting their own feature services, we'll just be able to pull those in directly. And that's still the ultimate goal. I, for, specifically for the state, um, not speaking on other agencies, not all departments are there at all, unfortunately, but they're getting there and they all have mandates to get there. 
But a problem that we were noticing was that once we would sometimes pull on these services, they were locked in terms of their symbology. We had a hard time relating them based off of community name alone, given that we had adopted this unique identifier. Um, so for some of those data sets where we're not quite to the point where they are actively updating their services and they're in a clean and friendly format that would fit our needs, we're pulling those in and we're localizing them and we're serving them back out. Uh, what we're not doing is we're not putting them as our authoritative sources. We're always pointing back to where they've come from. And if we can include the rest in service, we do do that. Um, so another many problems. Um, how do we deal with some of the limitations that are existing within the ArcGIS online platform? So for instance, we have a lot of ta um, temporal data going back tens of years, if not longer, we have tax data going back to 1962. So instead of loading down our server by putting out a year's worth of data each time, 62 different data sets and feature services, we've started to do group layers. So you can just pick what you need and I'll serve it out as just one service. ArcGIS has a long, hard time with group layers in terms of how it has specifically on the own maps. So what happens like we're constantly putting to this company's credit that incredibly responsive and so they can help you come up with a solution. Uh, they'll put it to their development team and maybe within six months they'll be in part of their new role or workarounds and so that's been a thing to have something that's so Responsive to actually, since we're utilizing their product, to know we're not out in the lurch. So if it doesn't work, there's usually a solution. Um, how do we get some of our old users to get into this mind frame of a GIS platform? Uh, we've been doing a lot of internal capacity building on this. We do a lot of demos. We try to get people to do hands on. Uh, any person from an agency outside, just a general researcher, we're pointing them to the new platform. We've got the rolled beta test guide, which I think we'll share with some of you, um, having them guide through, going through different aspects that we have, different apps, getting familiar with how it works, getting them their feedback. Um, again, what's really great about this is that it's so that we really can implement a lot of these feedbacks on the fly. And so we know this will never be a perfect system. Even when we completely turn the system on and we have this as our sole, our sole facing system, there's still going to be little things that we'll find here and there, and that will constantly be tweaking. And that's okay. We're actually really grateful. We now have that ability where in the past, mistakes and that was it. They were kind of something we just all had to accept as part of the existence of this database. In that we still haven't really figured out the best solution for us. Uh, we haven't fully rolled this out. We don't have the time to feedback how well this system is going to work in some of these small rural communities. Our system, like I said, is SQL based and it in itself isn't particularly snappy. Um, it takes a while to talk back to the servers depending on what the, the user is requesting. We've actually noticed an increased improvement in terms of broadband capacity with this new system because it's not going back down to this large quantity data, SQL database and trying to figure out what it is that I'm asking for. But we also know that once we start asking for audio files, um, and we are, if we work in rural life, we know that broadband is not necessarily something that's top of the line. So we're still somewhat waiting to hear how that's going to um, play for users at the community. And it might be such a thing that we have to put all our services online if we're noticing that much of a lag. Um, but it's something that we're going to have to see as we start to roll out more. And how can we cater this to our users who are using JS? And again, we're trying to, to show this is what we have to our services. And you know what we are doing now and vice versa. Um, 
um, something that the state has been working on, led by the honor that uh, Dr. alluded to. So it's been a long process, and the state might be slower to the upkeep than some of these private industries, um, but it's a long process. Uh, this is just what we have and how we can find it again. Um, so if you're looking for something specific about the community update, we're going to point you to the stories um, that replicate this, this most similar structure to the old CDO, so they might be the easiest for a new user to get their hands around. Um, notice that that's the most similar thing that they might be familiar with. If they start looking at different data sets and how those are relating or how communities are comparing with each other. We're sending them to the Build Your Own Maps. We do have some other interactive apps that are um, topic-specific. So we do have one currently on demographics, education. Um, we have the elected Board, which we've been hosting for two years now. We migrated it into this online platform. Um, so we do have some of these specific topical apps that are really useful if you're looking for something specific um, and you want to use some of the quick and filters that we've already built for you. Um, that's what's nice about those is that we can build these queries to anticipate what the user is going to need. But of course, those who are more experienced or who really just kind of want to play, we send them to the Build Your Own Map site. Um, if you're just looking for a specific data set about the community, we'll send you to that main page for download. You can, if you're looking for post offices or I, I don't know population trends over the years, we'll just the data for download. And you can either go to one of those larger radio buttons that have the icon, or specifically what you're looking for. Um, it's all run, all the search engines run behind the scene and tags. So we try to be self-inclusive in our tags so you can get to the data in a couple different ways if you don't necessarily know what topic it'll be under. Yeah, and this is just something that we kind of show uh, usually to not GIS users, this is a great way to get them to think about the type of data we have and how you can find it. Um, and starting to think you don't need one topic at a time. You can start looking at communities um, where the people who have fishing permits are actually living. Um, and again, it's another benefit of having this place-based um, part of our system is that you can see uh, well, if our fishing economy goes to states of Alaska, or of the wealth um, tax is in some of these larger places. Um, so how do we start building the capacity in our region? Um, we have local government specialists that work within our division, and they're constantly being asked by communities that we work with, what would it look like if we implemented a 2% sales tax? And so now you can go and look at the communities of just the same size and see what of them sales tax and what kind of revenue are they really generating to let the community know is this something that given the potential revenue that we could get in and them, then I can go reach out to these places that I know have less demographics and less economies and learn from them. So that's really what we're hoping that we can do with this is truly think about how we service communities better and how everyone who's working with communities or researching them can service them better. Yeah. Is there questions? Yes. So I've, I've used this quite a bit over the years. Thank you. Right now, maybe we can take suggestions on outreach. We're, we're first and foremost reaching out to state departments, um, agents who we know specifically use our database and who have linked out to our database in the past. Um, so the National Commission is one stakeholder. Uh, this afternoon, with the Alaska Assessors Association to give them an idea. Uh, we'll be present at the Alaska Municipal League as well to let them know we have this new format. We're kind of brainstorming our communication strategy. Not 
identify. We had a set number of partners who we wanted to reach out to. Um, it's been really great that we'll get suggestions. You know, it would actually be really helpful if you took this to X forum or if you took this to this company. Um, so if, if there's people who are missing, um, that would be great. Suggestions would be great. Because uh, right now we are thinking in our general partners, but it would be nice to get an, an idea of other users. Um, and again, we have this on our main um, DCR website. That new database is coming, and we've solicited just general users if their feedback. But then again, you kind of had to know that the original existed. Um, so any suggestions would be really helpful. Depends if you're trying to get the cat data, we're not going to put that on just because of the capacity of our server. Um, but community profiles and our imagery are available online. We have a you can specifically go to, um, and we've got to symbolize whether we have imagery or not. And then you can go there and get um, the community profile maps if we have them. And if you're looking specifically for um, some, we have those as well. The one thing we're not putting out there is probably going to be the CAD data. So, okay. <laughs> yep. So, <laughs> yeah, thank you. We've worked with them in a number of different capacities. And they have a GIS license as well, and they're somewhat thinking about getting there. Uh, but it's worth seeing what data sets we've missed. Uh, but again, the larger hope would be that they can see what we're doing and um, start reaching out to us and maybe kind of partner on how they can get their services out there as well. But yeah, that's a, we should check and see if there's anything that we're missing that Labor has that we're not hosting. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. Hosting that. Mm -hmm. So, how is that? I'm not familiar with ICER's infrastructure. It looks like we're doing a lot of things in house. Uh, we have chosen to mostly take everything that's just already available to us out of the box. We have done some custom Python scripting, um, particularly to replicate all those story maps 400 times. Um, but what we're deciding to do is use a company's platform that you know is widely used, not just in the state, with, but throughout the nation, um, and throughout the world, and trying to keep that somewhat low-tech. Um, full disclosure, I never had I didn't come in with a JS background whatsoever, so we have something that our staff who are research analysts can actually utilize. Um, so particularly certain with how users are using it. Uh, we have been in contact with some of their data. They host a lot of the PCE, price cost equalization, and they share that with us. Um, so it's, it's going to be maybe some modification of how they're putting their things out there and how we can capitalize on that. It's putting their data sources as services. Um, that would be really great if we can use theirs and vice versa. Those are all available. Um, so I think it will have to be as, I think, of this database. Um, and the thing is, is the grant funded, so the, the database has been, it's been useful and it's been around for a while, but it's not until they get grants that they can keep maintaining it. Um, and it's nice that we're hosting this at a, a state agency where it's our mandate to maintain it. Um, right.
working. So you, you have your site, ADG has their site, um, and then you know, obviously Fish and Game, and then DNR, and then you know what this, and, uh, and I imagine it's a largely like a Venn diagram. Right, um, where some of that overlap is okay as long as what we're all going to the same source. Or maybe there's a couple sources of data, one that you, get, you don't go to for some reason, perhaps for some technical reason, um, but it's maybe a little bit less uh, real time than maybe another database that might be real time, but there's another technical issue that right. we can't overcome right now. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. and that's something I'm thinking about because the point of this was. We were always pulling other people's data, and we we didn't really want to keep doing that um, because they were able to keep things up to date much better than we could. And so, again, as the state evolves, and I know D, uh, DOT is just setting up their enterprise database, so we're trying to keep these lines of communication open, particularly with D, uh, DNR, of what the services they have out there. Um, so we're not actually, either we're, we're going to them and pulling it in or we're localizing it, but we're not recreating it in any way whatsoever. We're accepting their schemas and accepting what they've put out there. So yeah, these are... And one thing in mind, I know we talked about the next next event um, in February, we perhaps focus on cyber security and kind of doing an NF uh, afternoon technical, but it might be some, I don't know if this exists, but mm -hmm. uh, Matsu Burrow's GIS team, your team, uh, Muni, I mean, I've been talking about Matsu and Muni getting together to kind of share knowledge and ideas, right? Because it's, uh, they're different platforms, right? Um, and I'm not sure if that's happened yet or not, but there's a lot of lessons learned to me among all the practitioners, amongst those two entities, amongst, as, as well as yourself and a, a lot of others. So it might be something that that's sounds of interest, and I'm looking at GIS team members here, as well as yourself, Grace. Yeah. Um, and others in the room, if that is, is of interest, right, then maybe we have a, a breakout, kind of a, a little bit more of a GIS practitioner uh, uh, session at some point on the tail end of the next forum or perhaps in the spring. Um, or for that matter, any time between forum events because it's but a couple of hours kind of a workshop. Uh, we've had the same top conversation, by the way, about training and shared training, which I want to bring up um, at the tail end of this afternoon or this morning session to see if we can actually re-energize that. We had a conference call planned uh, last summer, but everything kind of got parking lotted because of the, the cyber attack. So we're coming back back together. All right, well, thanks yeah, so much. Great. Thank you. So, so we've got snacks, coffee, and drinks, and uh, we'll reconvene here in 15 at 10 o'clock, and we'll get started on our next presentation. A lot of that is providing access and contextualization of the research and, and perspective Gardner has on how organizations are leveraging technology and how to use that within their organization. My background, uh, I've been at Gartner as an executive department for a little over a year now, uh, and I come from the retail industry predominantly. Uh, I've spent a lot of years uh, deploying retail systems across North America, Europe, and Asia. Retailers in a number of different categories. Uh, most recently, prior to Gartner, I was at Starbucks and I was the uh, technology executive that was accountable for running the digital platform. So that's a little bit about me. Let's uh, let's talk about digital transformation. Um, so it was giving some thought of how do I make this meaningful rather than just a whole lot of research and things that are you know important for. Hundred billion dollar global organizations, but how do we make it meaningful for this audience? So I kind of came down to some four key questions. Digital one: What are we talking about? Because this is a classical I use sixty dollar word. Uh, it's in contract terms, traditionally an undefined statement. Digital transformation: What does that actually mean? Two: Why should we care about this? Why is this important for you? Why should you be thinking about this? Um, in lieu of case studies, as far as other smart cities or smart governments, I thought I'd kind of focus on what's something you can consider doing differently. In the, Eric, you've often asked the question here, what does phishing mean to you? And it's probably different for everybody. So I'm quick, what does digital mean to anybody? Anybody have, when we say digital, 
anybody have a perspective on what that means for you? Yes. Available on various devices in various places. That's pretty good, right? So when Wozniak and Jobs started Apple, Wozniak wanted to create beautiful technology. Jobs wanted to change the world. He started that process in 2007 with the iPhone first launch. How we as humans interact with technology today has fundamentally changed as a result of that act. That is the pervasive access. We now have compute devices tethered to us as we move about the world that we could not have conceived of 20 years ago. Right? Cloud. Cloud really is about turning compute, so let's go back to the basic realities of technology, compute, storage, network. Cloud is about turning compute into a commodity, just like electricity. You walk into a room, you turn on a switch, you have light. Distributed compute, AWS, Azure, so on and so forth, that is about turning compute into a commodity. You turn it on when you want it, you turn it off when you don't. You don't have to buy a bunch of servers for your data center to a specific capacity. Use what you need when you need it. We're still in this transition period to take advantage of that. That's really where we're going. My first introduction to that was I was at an AWS conference in, in London in 2010. Uh, it was AWS rolling out to EMEA. Uh, Werner Vogels, the chief technology officer at Amazon, was giving a description of what, uh, what cloud was and he threw a picture of an old steam engine with a bunch of old guys standing on it. And he says, what is this? No one can answer. And he says, well, it's a brewery. I'm Belgian, so this is a picture of a brewery, and this is the steam engine that powered the brewery, and these are the 11 engineers who took care of the steam engine. And then he asks the question, how many breweries have engines and engineers that keep that brewery running anymore? No one. That's how we start. So, on the other side of this, when we look at social, now that we have very powerful compute devices in everybody's pocket, now we have social platforms that grow on those things. That provides us visibility into human behavior and human relationships that we have never had access to before. Now we get into a lot of ethical questions around what does that mean and our organization is using that data for good or not for good. That's a whole different conversation. But the platform now enables that to be possible. Our understanding of human behavior and human interaction is completely different. Something that we've never been able to understand in the history of human as a social species. Context and knowledge, information. Okay, again, now that I have this compute device in my pocket, for serving capabilities, applications, I have an ability to understand the context that the person's in, who's interacting with my technology, unlike anything I've ever been able to do. I know where they are. I know how, they're long, how long they're interacting with that technology. I know what they're trying to do with it. So my understanding at the personal level, that might be an abstracted person, an anonymous, per anonymous person, but still at the personal level is information that I did not have before. So that's the foundation. A very different reality of how humans interact with technology. Then what happens is now we have the Internet of Things. And these are some numbers, 2009 to 2020. So the projections you see over here in 2020 were around 2016 when we put these out. And we're still on pace for that. And the idea of the Internet of Things is really, now I have objects out in the world who can sense, analyze, act, and communicate in whatever way I want them to. By 2020, we project that there are 7.3 billion personal devices in the world. 20 billion internet connected things, so that's in addition to, and that we expect that the idea, the relationship of people to connected devices is for a while. 
It's a very different reality than, again, what we thought possible 20 years ago. These two things working together basically is what has created digital, where you really have a blurring of the physical and the virtual world, right? Things, people, and organizations are just, it's a seamless network between the two of them, okay? That, at its core, when, when, when we talk about digital, at least from a Gartner perspective, this is really what we're talking about. The changing nature of technology, the changing nature of human interaction with technology, and how that is completely transforming the way in which we go about our life. And that the representation of what I'm doing in the physical world is very easy to represent in the digital world. What does that mean? How do I behave differently, both as an individual and then as an organization? Okay? So, with that in mind, let's talk about a specific example of how this manifests in an industry and the type of change that's going on. Because I'd say we are in the midst of a transformational age beyond just the catch word of digital transformation. I think the nature of human reality is changing as a function of the changing reality of technology. So let's look at the industry, music industry. How many of us remember pressed LPs? They were great, right? The context of the A side, B side, the idea of the album as a holistic thing, that's an important, that was an important reality. Compact disc comes along and we kind of digitize those things. Eventually we get into a network reality in the early days of the internet, right? Peer-to-peer -peer networking, after so on, that changes the fundamental nature of how we distribute music as intellectual property, right? Technology went faster than the industry and the business construct. It broke it, right? We all know what happened in Napster, <coughs> created a bit of a problem. Eventually, iTunes was kind of the first out there to solve the business problem. Oh, okay, now that I can distribute in this way, how do we do that in a way that the intellectual property-based business of music still is holistic? That gets us to kind of that digital download. Once that business problem or the operational problem has been solved, then you just get the evolution of stream. When's the last time you actually bought an album? I can't remember. I just subscribed to playlists that fit my mood, and that's about it. It's great music, I still enjoy music in life, but how I interact with that is completely different than how I used to interact with it. And that transformation was driven by the change in technology, nothing else. Because I guarantee you that industry didn't want to change. Because the money they make in that industry is not the same as they used to. So, what we kind of talk about there is the difference between how do I optimize? So as things change, as things evolve, I'm thinking about how I'm changing my organization and how am I optimizing its, its uh, its business, its mission, based on technology. At some point, however, you get to an inflection point and you must transform. Right? So this goes back to a little bit of Andy Grove, founder and CEO of Intel. Some of his early writings, all organizations on a growth curve come to an inflection point, and at that inflection point, they must transform in some way, or they will start the downward curve. So you can continue to optimize and prove what you do, how you do, how you do it, so on and so forth, but you're gonna get to a point where transformation is required. If you don't transform, you won't survive. An example of this, I was in the office, uh, one of the members I support about nine months ago, and we were taught, I was challenging his thinking, and he said, Tim, I'm 
We, we are such and such. Very well-respected global brand. And my only response to him was, and everybody used to buy everything from Sears. When's the last time you bought something from Sears? They're not around anymore. So, the need to transform is real. Why do I care about this? Because you can say, okay, that's important for global organizations, it's important for commercial organizations. Why do I need to care about this? So when we look at the public sector, government, public services, education, higher education, why do I care about this? One simple reason. All of us have increasing expectations based on our personal use of technology. Because we all now have this smartphone in our pocket, question, how many of you have read an instruction manual about any of the technology that sits on your phone? No one. How many of you have systems you work with at work or interact with as a citizen that you just oh, don't know how it works. I run into that every day. And my company specializes in advancing technology. Right? So our expectation as individuals is increasing as the advancement of technology continues forward. Right? And that pace of change, Moore's Law. Right? Change just accelerates. We're still accelerating. I'm sure all of us, I know Eric does, he wrestles with, hey, I only have so many dollars. This is all great. I can't, but I only have so many dollars to spend. I can't keep pace with that change. It's difficult. So this gap continues to increase. Right? It's not that you should try to change your funding to immediately close the gap, because that's likely not going to happen. Right? But it's understanding that that gap exists, so that when you think about the types of initiatives, projects, things you want to pursue, you're going to pursue them in a way that helps close that gap. Okay? I think the last forum, uh, the railroad uh, gave, a, that was a great talk on, on using the uh, Esri capabilities. That in and of itself personifies the opportunity to digital. Just before the break, again, using those technologies where you're creating better partnerships with your vendor community and writing their capabilities, because they're going to be the ones investing in these things. So it's finding a way to leverage what's going on to solve meaningful problems. There's the key point. To solve meaningful problems. Solving meaningful problems for all of us really gets down to our culture. So kind of bringing this home to, rather than trying to get dollars you can't get to implement completely new technology, what are some things that you can start thinking about? One of them is the culture in your organization and how are you a change agent in this transformational age? What we see in our research, organizations that are really leaning in and succeeding are not all organizations that just have really deep pockets. But they're organizations that are thinking about their culture in a way that they're promoting a mindset that solves meaningful problems in a way that resonates with their stakeholder group, whether that be a citizenry or a customer or a business partner. And key aspects of those cultural patterns really are, one, a collaborative culture. Really supporting collaboration across work groups, not just in IT, but across your entire organization, important. Finding ways to be more agile, 
And when I say agile, we're not talking about agile methodology in the software development world. We're talking about the ability to pivot from one direction to the other direction because you just learned something new. And we all probably learn something new every day, right? So it's making sure that your organization that you're working in has the ability to, ooh, we just learned something new, I think we should change gears a little bit. And analytical, data-driven decisions. Innovative, not willing, not unwilling to explore new ideas. Being willing to take a little bit of risk, measured risk, right? And being creative. Innovation and creativity are different. I think oftentimes when we kind of have this conversation, well, aren't those things the same? Not really. Because I can be creative with things that aren't innovative. Right? Just apply some old stuff to a new use case. It's not really innovation, but it is creative. Okay? So finding a way to cultivate these cultural norms and these behaviors in our organization is part of that transformation. And like I said, this doesn't require millions of dollars in a tech budget, but helps position your, your organization for success. So that's why you should care. We've got a growing expectation gap between our citizens and the services we provide them, our customers and the way in which we fill their needs, and in the education space, our students, and how they'd like to learn. So, what should we be doing different? How do we kind of walk down this road? I'll give you kind of one way of thinking about this, and hopefully with the idea that you've got something that you can take away from the room today. Traditional. This is kind of when we think about process improvements in technology or in most IT shops, it's traditionally been the inside-out perspective, right? So focus on systems and processes that deliver value by providing a more stable foundation, right? And we think about that from a, what's the process? How do I work the process? So on and so forth. This is really around standardization. But what we're doing here is we're internally thinking about our organization, how we operate, and how we want our stakeholders outside, the people that are outside that circle, the implied assumption there is they're going to comply with the way in which we think we should operate, because we know better. The modern perspective, really, to lean into digital is an outside-in perspective. Your focus, customers, the partners, the peers, what outcomes are they looking for? What's the meaningful problem that they want solved? And how do I deliver value to that problem statement? So it's no longer about how we want the process to work and how we want to design the process. It's starting with who's the stakeholder, who's the citizen, who's the student, who's the customer, what do they want solved, and let's be empathetic and put ourselves in their shoes and figure out how we want to solve it. Where this is evolving to really is kind of an ecosystem perspective. And I think what you're doing with RTIS is a great example, where you're becoming, how do you see your organization, your operation, as an intermediary between a series of vendors and partners to deliver services to stakeholders and constituents and customers, right? This is how the world's gonna look in a network reality. We're seeing more and more network systems, using systems in a small s, evolve in the world than we've ever seen before in history. <coughs> One 
when we talk about social media, those are network structures. The power social media has today gives you an example of the power of a network structure. So when you think about how are we solving problems, interesting, meaningful problems, moving in this direction is a, is a, a good thought to consider. So, when we take that outside-in perspective, when we put ourselves in the shoes of our citizenry, or our customer, or our student, and think about what is their interest, what is the problem they want to solve, or are trying to solve, the way in which we do that is the concept of a journey journey map. So when you're looking at all of the, the commercial organizations out in the globe that are doing really interesting things and succeeding exceptionally well in the digital economy, they're all organizations that do this very well. And that's how they got to apps on your phone that you don't need instruction manuals for. Because they're completely intuitive. Because the designers of those things try to put themselves in your shoes to figure out how do I deliver to this to the, this individual in the best way possible. A great example of this, I support a number of, of clients in the financial services industry. Great, and this should be reasonably understandable for everybody who's ever bought a home. An inside out perspective, or we're talking about how our process works within the organization is the idea, oh, okay, we've got to make the mortgage application process digital. That's what we're going to do. We're going to define how, we, how our customers apply for a mortgage in a digital context. That is not taking a customer journey approach. Because the journey the customer is on is not getting a mortgage. It's buying a home. So what's that journey look like? And when you widen your aperture, widen your thought process more in that way, you begin to see a lot more opportunities <coughs> to touch your customer, to touch your constituent in a different way. It puts yourself in their shoes and you walk through that journey. What does that look like? Journey map that we see here is, and, and I chose this one. This is the Rail Europe experience map. Part of the reason I'm throwing this up, there's a whole bunch of information on this journey map online. So if this seems interesting to you, this is something you can go do further reading on. Um, but there's some key components to what a good journey map looks like. The top of that is the lens. What lens am I going to, if I'm the designer, what lens am I going to put on this journey as I think about it from the customer's perspective? It's your overriding filter. So things like people choose rail travel because it's convenient, easy, and flexible. Rail booking is only one part of people's larger travel processes. Me being an enterprise architect earlier in my career, you could also look at these as principle statements, guiding principles, and so on and so forth. It gives you some criteria also that you can look at that journey against. <coughs> this is where you want to start. So if we kind of go back to that the buying a home, first place to start if you're in a little bit of a design work group is, okay, if the customer's journey is buying a home, what are the key principles that most people have when they're buying a home? Start with that. Simple list. Keep it short. Next, this is the journey model. Call it a process model. Call it a process flow. Um, the more interesting you can draw them, this is where you can start pulling out new learnings and different ways of thinking about the process 
that your customer or your constituent or your student is going through to highlight new opportunities for you to help them. They don't all need to look alike. They don't all need to look kind of like this. But really, what does the design team want it to look like based on observation? This is in a kind of the lean world manufacturing. One of these concepts in lean is the concept of the Gemba walk. A Gemba walk is, Gemba means go see. So a Gemba walk is, if you're a designer and you're trying to solve a problem in a certain space, go into that space. Watch people. See what they're doing. You're going to see the problems they need solved, even though they may not recognize them. Just through observation. Based on that observation, you're drawing a map that illuminates key dimensions, that's very, very, very important. This gives you the opportunity to figure out how you pivot. How do you want to think about this in a different way? Draw the map that prompts you in a way to think about your problem space differently. And think through what are the phases. That gets us kind of to this top level. What are the overall phases this person's going through? For instance, in buying a home, what's the first phase that triggers someone to say, I want to buy a home? Next, qualitative insights. Here's where the empathy comes into play. Here's where putting yourself in the shoes of your stakeholder, the constituent, the customer, and the student. Here's where this happens. In this method, you want to think about what are they doing? What are they thinking? How are they feeling? Right? I think in the last session, as you were talking about what you were doing with the Esri capabilities, there was some frustration in that story. I remember at the beginning of, well, oh, it's going to take us a lot of time. It's going to cost fifty thousand dollars. There's some feeling going on there. So as you walk through your process, think about how the customer is interacting with the process you're presenting to them. Swim lessons. You solved a big problem. A problem that people were not feeling good about, right? How much of that was a motivation to think about how you want, what you put first in your e comm platform, right? Solving the big problem, solving the things that cause real frustration for people helps you get to solutions that are meaningful, that people adopt quickly. Thinking asks, how do I, how can I use this? Is it going to work? Is it valuable? Right? As you're representing your journey map, the feeling side, you want to talk about how customers are feeling in that step of the process. Write it down. This is that process of articulating the feeling gives you visibility to what problem are you solving or not solving. Qualitative, pretty straightforward. Qualitative information is as you lay out your journey map, what are the things that are happening that you can measure, right? At the end of the day, we're talking about investing time and energy. That means we need to make sure that we're getting a return on that time and energy investment. So as you think about constructing a journey, being qualitative and understanding what data you can capture relative to the journey and how you measure its efficacy and efficiency is important. And then the takeaways. The takeaways really is where this becomes an iterative process. If you walk down the road of starting to leverage a journey map construct, 
as a way of working, I think that it's important that you don't see the map itself as the conclusion. Right? It's a bit of the cliche, you know, life's about the journey, not the destination. Once you have your first version of a map done, you're not done. That's just the first version. We live in a human world that's always changing, that map's going to change. Your takeaways in that first version is really where you start thinking about where could this go. Drives the next phase. Articulates opportunities or pain points that you might not be able to solve in this first version of an MVP that you're putting out. But it gets you some ideas to stick in your backlog of, okay, version two, we're going to tackle that problem. So, what's coming in the future? Let's look at the, how many of you are familiar with Gardner Hype Cycle? Okay, I'll do a quick primer here. Um, some wonderful marketing material for us, but it actually is meaningful and good stuff. Uh, so, the innovation trigger. Uh, this is basically, we plot new technologies on a hype cycle. And down below, years to mainstream adoption, and really kind of the adoption is here. Less than two years, two to five, five to ten, more than ten, or before it actually becomes mainstream, it's going to be obsolete. So the innovation trigger, usually when a new technology hits the press, that's the innovation trigger for us. We start paying attention to it. When in the press it becomes hype, is it, this is a game changer, it's gonna transform everything. That's what we call the peak of inflated expectations. So the press always goes faster than reality. The trough of disillusionment is, yeah, <laughs> this is not yet a game changer. <laughs> Thanks for all that. I wasted a lot of time and energy. So you get into that trough of disillusionment, but it, you know the valley of despair that we any of us that have implemented any technology projects, you always go through that valley of despair. There's a dark time. You'll eventually get out of it. That's the slope of enlightenment. Uh, understanding the real and relative impact of technology is building, and then it becomes mainstream. Right now you're at the point where you're harvesting the capability that that technology brought to bear. So that's the general structure. So I'm going to close with this. This is what our hype cycle looks like for smart city technologies today. I won't go through all of it. This is a rather extensive research paper. But I did underline three things. And I'm going to underline these three things because one, they're, they're not things that require millions of dollars of investment. And two, they are things that are on the innovation trigger that we say are going to hit that plateau in two to five years. So new things that are gonna mature very quickly. First one is civic and community development. So simple case study, New York City, <coughs> Citizen developers using some open data, and this category of data for good, pushed out an app to help people with parking. Reduction of parking, no. City of New York probably doesn't like this because it was a bit of a revenue reduction for them. But um, parking fines materially grow. This was not something the city built. It was not something the company built. It was something a group of citizens built. Right? At the break, we were talking about how do we pool resources to help in the realm of cybersecurity. This is in that vein of how do we, as a group of citizens in an area, combine resources to be better than each of ourselves individually. Right? For organizations that don't have big, deep pockets, Community development from a technology perspective is a great way to tap into technology talent. What's growing here is the ability to do that in a safe, secure way. Okay. Second one, chatbots. These are evolving extremely fast. 
The world of natural language processing is exponentially better than it was two years ago, and it's going to be exponentially better 12 months from now. I can actually talk to Siri now, or more importantly, Siri can actually understand what I'm saying now. It took a while to get there. As we see Google Home, we see Alexa, these are just ongoing examples where the chat bot and that natural language interaction is becoming a very, very important way for humans to interface with technology. I just finished a little bit of a project. Uh, I'm a home brewer. I've been a home brewer for about, about 27 years. Uh, I just upgraded my brewery at home to a Raspberry Pi with some Python scripts and some Amazon trained, so it's voice command now. It's a fully automated brewery, voice command. It's beautiful. <laughs> my wife rolls her eyes every time I'm out there. But this technology is becoming easier and easier to tap into. We're seeing it used exceptionally well in higher education, where things like registration. Over the summer months, summer melt, where students drop off. They don't uh, come back in the fall for a number of different reasons. A lot of them are around the complication of registering for classes in the fall. <clears throat> Georgia State, little POC built by two developers in the comp sci department, pushes out a chatbot, uh, and they reduced summer melt by 5% the first time out. They took 50,000 student inquiries in one month. No increase in FTE, huge value, simple solution. And I can guarantee you every one of those students probably love talking to it better than getting on a phone and the whole process of having to talk to someone on the phone. So chatbots, you can see a lot more of this. And then data for good. The whole concept of open data providing, now this is where security also becomes an interesting part of the, the puzzle, but providing access to data in a way that your citizenry or constituency can leverage that data for good. So. I'll stop there. Three things that you should see maturing very rapidly. I went quickly, and I think I'm over five by five minutes. Apologies. Do we have time for questions? Oh yeah. Any thoughts, questions? A lot very fast. You, when you were talking about the gap, Going back to that slide, you had a there was a change in slope in the employee ability graph. Yes. Uh, does that what does that reflect and why is that there? This one. Yeah. The employee ability to exploit all of a sudden takes a major uptick. So our top line here is this is the advancing new technology. So the new releases of technology over time. This bottom line is, those of us that work in organizations, we're not going that fast. So this slope of innovation and, and new capabilities is rising faster than we can keep up. So sooner or later we get into this situation and we're kind of here now where the type of tools and capabilities that we provide as organizational leaders for our employees internally, and let's say for many government organizations for their constituency, we, we can't keep pace. We don't have the dollars to keep pace with the commercial organizations that are driving all that technical innovation. Does that make sense? Yeah, but up there it looks like that line all of a sudden takes a major uptick from the employee ability. Is that a cultural change of maybe more millennials in the workflow percentage or? What makes that tick up like that on the lower line? Um, in a lot of, I think this is, is, I don't know that that's not necessarily, uh, there's not hard data behind that. It's more representational. But I do think it is what we've been seeing, let's say, over the past five years is the deprecation of legacy platforms where those legacy platforms are never going to support a digital experience. And when I say digital experience, I mean real time, 
and you're sort of disowned as a threat. So as we see old legacy platforms dropping off in the world, the internal ability to pivot and innovate is increased for fewer dollars. Gotcha. Pat. Um, at the beginning you mentioned funding, challenges with funding, and we all know that when we innovate, we have to keep the old stuff alive while we're making new stuff. Yes. Do you have any strategies or your customers hit that secret sauce of getting the people in those chairs behind you to say, yes, here's more money to bring us into the future? Or is it just good luck with that? <laughs> I can't say that any one of, uh, I can't say that, that any of the folks I support or even in the research I'm seeing with, with, with others in the dark universe, that anybody's you know found the silver bullet or the secret sauce. Um, I think it is some keys to being successful there. The ability to tell a compelling story, right? So if you're looking for money, there's a whole bunch of research that says, don't talk about facts and figures and data, because that's not gonna get you your money. Talk about a story. Make the story compelling and human. You are far more likely to get your dollars if you can tell a story. So that's one. Two, once you get your money, you have to deliver. That's the, that's the secret sauce, I think. Yeah. It's, it's motherhood now, my answer is motherhood now, what? but it, it's, it's, yeah. Jim. Oh, just an observation on the line there. You're out past 2020, so it's very predictive. Probably the AI, IoT era where, you know, a lot more robotics and automation and machine learning. Maybe that's the, the uptake of this year's point. But I was looking, that's why I'd be on 2020 where that shows that. Right, right. We've got a, we've got a clean house quite a bit before we can get to that point. It's really ideating in a rapid way. Absolutely. And we're not there yet. Yeah. Yes. Do you use students in your example as um, heavy consumers? And do you have an example of um, a very progressive, maybe education, educational institution that's kind of adopted digital transformation ideology and deployed that? Um, I do from a higher ed perspective. Um, some, the Georgia state system is a state system that has leaned into uh, digital technology quite heavily. Uh, both Georgia Tech, Georgia State um, are doing interesting things. Um, also in New York, uh, they're doing some interesting things. And then we kind of see pockets in other places. Um, I support a few Pac-12 schools. Um, they, both of them have begun to lean in, um, but they're worried the, how do we clean out the trash in order to do the interesting stuff. So they're still part in that front side of that, that curve. Anything on a K-12 public arena? Um, I don't know of off the top of my head, but I mean, can we, I can, we can follow up. Yeah, yeah. Um, and because there are some, some K-12 through organizations around the, the country that are doing interesting things. Absolutely. All right. Sure. All right, thanks so much. Thank you. Question: um, ASU and the City of Phoenix are actually working collaboratively together on smart community uh, collaboration, as well as University of Reno and the City of Reno doing the same thing. So we're seeing more and more collaboration between higher ed and, and local government, as we are between you know necessarily state governments. Um, so we'll talk about urban data management and how that kind of uh, builds into it. But first, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Chuck Lott. I'm with uh, Dell EMC. And I've been with uh, the company for about seven years now. That includes the merger. I came from the EMC side. Um, as you may have known, Dell Technologies is now actually a family of eight companies. So um, real quick, I promise, 
Dell clients, infrastructure, cloud native application development, SecureWorks, RSA, um, our security companies. Um, Virtual Stream is a service provider, internet service provider off premise. Um, and uh, VMware is a, if you will, a cloud orchestration uh, company. If you are familiar with virtualization and how you can leverage those saw that software to be more efficient, um, it also works with the cloud integrations with uh, a bunch of our ecosystem of our partners. And Boomi is an application interface uh, software that's uh, based in the cloud that allows you to navigate data across different providers, whether it's on-premise or off-premise. I should say, by the way, um, the term smart cities, I, I don't really like that one. I, I use the term smarter cities because cities use technologies now and, and, and the way of looking at this, these new capabilities, as a way to be smarter to help their citizens. Ultimately, it's about having a happy place to live, citizens that are engaged, citizens that are happy. It doesn't have to be a, a huge um, high-tech hub of everything tech. It's really about making sure that you scale to what makes sense for the community that you're in. But there is a lot of change going on. And the topic I'm talking about is urban data uh, as part of, part of this ecosystem. And so the communities are facing challenges. I mean, we all have smartphones like we heard Tim talk about. We all are now carrying around edge devices. Um, and what's happening is that urbanization is real. We're actually predicting by, what's that, 2050, 75% of people in the U.S. will be in an urban environment, less in a country environment. And me, though, I just moved into the country, so I'm on 10 acres and, and love the view, so uh, I don't know, I guess I'm bucking the trend there. But it does affect change about how people interact with their communities. Um, there's more people together, there's more services that are needed, and there's problems. We have challenges. The infrastructure is hard to upgrade. It's expensive to upgrade. It's hard to get money. We just talked about what's the secret sauce for getting city councils uh, to fund fund things, and, and there's a whole bunch of uh, answers, but there's no one really good answer. Certainly, a compelling story is obvious, but also baby steps. And we'll talk about how um, San Jose did some baby steps a little bit later on uh, in a couple of use cases that I have. But the thing that's interesting about um, the notion of smart communities or digital communities, as Dell likes to say, because we think of digital communities as high ed, K-12, local government, state governments. So it's really a community of, of different capabilities. And everybody just wants to be efficient. We want safety for our kids. We want our data to be safe. We want to maintain our privacy. But we want to be enriching. We want it to be more interactive and useful for us. And it should be for everybody. Nobody's excluded from this capability. And uh, imagine this. And these are examples. These are real. And this is going on already today. Uh, right now, Bellevue, Washington has reduced traffic times 36% by using some of these technologies. Energy consumption reduced in Spain. Predictive policing in New York saved them $90 million. Another example about predictive policing in the uh, city of Charlotte Mecklenburg in North Carolina. They actually, uh, the police department, the chief went to the city council and said, I need another officer. I just need another body out on the street helping to police. And they said, nope. <laughs> oh, gee, thanks. I really appreciate your concern and your support. No, go fix the problem using technology. So they looked at it. Um, we were part of an ecosystem of companies that came in and helped them. Um, used predictive analytics to better predict where crime would happen in that city. Reduced crime saved money. The problem was communities outside that area all of a sudden saw a crime increase go up because the police realized that's, you know, Charlotte, Mecklenburg, it's better police now. So, you know, a good thing and a sort of a oops thing. But the idea being that predictive analytics are real and can, can help a community be safer and be safer for everybody. Another example, um, improved city functions. New York City, again, doing a lot of work in this, in this area to uh, improve how they operationally behave. Um, but when we talk about Internet of Things in a few minutes, New York City also just did a survey of all their devices on the, on the network. They found 100,000 of them they didn't know existed. And they think that that's about a tenth of what they really have out there. So the security implications on this are tremendous. 
Chicago is using this to using these technologies to monitor air and water quality. And then um, Seoul, Korea is improving their ability to recycle. So just a couple of you know five or six examples here of where these different uh, communities are doing things to help improve the citizen environment. It all comes down to data. Leveraging the data that you have, being smart about what your priorities are, understanding why you want to do something, not just do something because you can do something. Make sure you have a compelling argument and buy in and take baby steps. This can work, and it does work. At some point, you know, as the communities evolve, it becomes really an ecosystem of capabilities. So if you look at all the city or community services, you know, this is a subset of them, but they can all be linked together. Now, you don't start to do all this all at once. It's, it's, it's not recommended, virtually impossible, and nobody will fund that. So the reality is you take the baby steps, but you plan for this kind of environment before you get there. And even the next step after that is you can start working with local government, state government, federal government, and each have their own communities of information that you can share and leverage across across government entities to help citizens and to help operational improvements. The Internet of Things is huge. Uh, Tim spoke about it a few minutes ago about how big it's going to be in 2020. We're predicting by 2031 there's going to be 200 billion devices. That's going to be 25 times more than the population of the Earth in that year. Can you imagine that? Every person's going to have 25 devices in effect per capita, right? Globally. That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. And so some of the things that are emerging now to address that are artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, all these technologies are coming in place to try to figure out how to get their arms around this information. And what's interesting finding so far is that simple algorithms with a lot of data will outperform those big complex data warehouses you've had in the past. There's a different architecture and different ways you can do these things and simplify it and be more useful, and it's less expensive. So this goes back to a different theme of, of why to do all this stuff, and it's really to tailor the experience to the city, and the results of studies are showing that people are happier when they, under, when they have a digital community environment moving forward. They did studies that says, hey, we're happier, we're more engaged, we think our quality of life has actually improved as a consequence of a smart way of applying technology to solve citizen problems. But there's some considerations. I mean, a digital strategy is not a one-stop shop. Um, we do this stuff. Gartner advises on it. A lot of other companies are doing it. Kind of like the cyber world. If you look at a logo sheet of all the different companies in cybersecurity today, you'll see about a thousand logos uh, right now, probably 2,000 by the end of next year. Um, but there are some real things to think about as you move forward with, it, with considering a digital strategy. You know, first of all, you know, why are you doing it? You can help the citizens, make it a better community, scale it to what the community needs. But also realize that you need to have a, a plan in place to allow you to scale over time. So it's not a one-stop thing. You do a pilot, but you can go in there with a design up front so that you understand what you're trying to get to at the end of the day. One of the consequences that's happening because of the Internet of Things is that a distributed architecture model is emerging. So when we said there's going to be 200 billion devices in uh, is that 12 years, I did that 13 years, I did the math here. Um, we're going to find that there's going to be a different way people are going to not just interact and what they're saying, 40% of our interaction in, in 15 years is going to be with machines. And we don't even know it. That's kind of interesting, right? But also what we're finding is that the distributed architecture model is probably the next evolution of how information is going to be processed. Because if we have 200 billion devices out here, there's no possible way you can shoot all that information across to a service provider, whether it's a cloud or your own premise. It's just, just too much. The network latency is going to kill you. The storage will kill you. You don't need it. And besides, if you have a device like a light, a smart light, it's sending 1.6 gigabytes of data per day, a smart one. And you know what 90% of it is? I'm on, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on. 
That's what he said. Do you really care about that? No. So you have to filter out what to send and what not to send. And so they're gonna, there's more computing that's going to be happening out here to determine what actually goes back there for a different kind of analysis. Michael Dell, our chairman, says that 40% of the computing will be on the edge within 12 years. Some people say he's, he's underestimating, but mm -hmm. Intel's really happy, they're selling a lot of chips, so. <laughs> <clears throat> um, if you look at it a little bit differently from this, from this um, distributed model, you know, here's all the different places, and this is, they call it the fog. I mean, that's the, that's the current term. So it's data that's sort of in the middle between whether it should be in the cloud or it should be on the edge, and where should the compute lie? It's, it's an evolving model. Um, we believe that a hybrid model over time is, gives you the most flexibility, hybrid meaning that you know, your data can be at any service provider, you can, you know, whether it's your own, ours, Amazon's, Microsoft's, doesn't matter, as long as you can move it around. As long as it's transportable, that's a hybrid model, gives you the most choice, the most flexibility over time. Eventually, you'll get to this idea of a single platform or an ecosystem of tools to create a platform. And we have a big chunk of this, of course. Other companies have a lot of big chunks of this. Um, but this is sort of where the whole uh, community looks can, uh, can look. You, know, you want to be open, agile, secure, um, needs to be flexible. And we like to use the term software defined. Everybody familiar with the software defined terminology? Meaning you don't care about the hardware anymore, you just use software to move things around. Configure your network by software, not by plugs and switches and things like that, make it easier. Um, <clears throat> related to all this, again, is security. Security is always going to be a part of this. When you talk about all those devices, all those problems, um, when we look at the old world cybersecurity, it was just put up a brick wall and, and hope it didn't get in. That was the old model. It really does not work. I mean, we saw from the presentation earlier today um, exactly what happened here, which is this. They were targeted. Can you see that again? They were stealthy. That's what it says there. And they were interactive. They planned this. So there was your intrusion. They came in, checked things out, and they acted. This is the model that happened here. Then the attack was identified, and then you figure out a response. Well, the new way of doing this is to actually move forward your ability to identify an attack before it happens. That's the goal. <clears throat> Have a response ready to go even before an attack happens. You're not going to be able to stop the attack, perhaps, but perhaps you can have a better handle on how to respond to it prior to it happening, if you have knowledge of it. And then to help mitigate, not stop, but mitigate the ability of the act of, an, of intrusion is increase the friction of them getting in the first place. Oh, this is not free, by the way. It costs a lot of money. It's really hard. Um, you know, there's a lot of resources out there, whether it's the federal government, um, companies out there like us and ours. You know, this is not easy stuff. But if you look at it from a standpoint of how do I go about thinking about the money of this, um, currently this is how money was usually allocated for cybersecurity. It was all about prevention. Put those walls up, make them thick as you can, and keep them out. Just keep them out. Oh, and then respond. Plan for response and monitoring some. What we're really finding is that that model is evolving. It should be one third, one third, one third. That's what we're advising our customers today. Put one third in each of those. Have a response plan ready to go before you need to use it. Prevent actively. The hottest professional uh, career right now is cybersecurity. Cybersecurity. People in the military are coming out of the military and with that background, and many of them have clearances. They're going right into that uh, job and um, cleaning up. <laughs> Another aspect to digital communities um, is blockchain. So I'm not going to get into all the details and technical aspects of it, but it is um, it is coming. It's going to be all over the place. It's going to be adopted on a global basis. Uh, there's a lot of countries that are considering adopting it right now because they'd rather just skip over all the other stuff and just go right to a secure way of having um, uh, 
secure contracts, to have safer elections. It's an append-only digital measure. It uses encryption, so it's safe. There's different types of blockchains. There's private blockchains, there's public blockchains. The public blockchains that use like cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, those are you know, slow, a little bit cumbersome, but right now I think the Bitcoin one has, at last stat, 120 million transactions in it roughly. It's only five years old. It's pretty amazing. But blockchain doesn't have to be involved with, with uh, cryptocurrency. That's just kind of part of what it can do. And here's just some of the use cases that are being used right now in the blockchain world. The, the observation I have about blockchain is that it is not something that is coming from IT. It's coming from city councils. It's coming from state legislatures. State legislatures have put more blockchain legislation in the books in the last two and a half years than any IT conversation I've seen nationally. I go to national conferences like National Association of State CIOs and State Technology Directors. Blockchain, oh yeah, we're kind of, kind of looking at that. Talk to the legislatures, oh yeah, we already have legislation to adopt. And why is that happening? Well, because banks see this as a big next step in how financial transactions will be managed. The state of Ohio is using it right now. Um, I can go on for several more of those, but what's in, the one that's interesting to me is election systems. Back in a former life, I designed election systems. So I got involved with sort of voter registration and, and how the election night reporting works and all that kind of stuff. And they're using blockchains right now in several states to manage the, uh, or, or to confirm the identity of a service person serving overseas as a way to make, make sure that their vote is considered, um, well, make sure that they're the right person, uh, but then also to keep their vote anonymous, which is the, is the secret to democracy, right? Nobody knows who we voted for. Let's talk about it. There's a lot of that going on. <clears throat> um, one of the things that Dell does is that we partner with folks in the digital communities world. So Atos, is one of our partners, and these are just four of the different offerings that we bring to the table with those guys. Um, urban data management, one of them, I'm going to talk about that for a second. We also do managed video surveillance, which as we know, body cams, cop cams, drone cams. There's cams about everywhere nowadays, right? So um, we do solutions with those guys on that. Next Generation 911, and we're partnering with them on that. You know, the whole uh, first responder new network that's going in place. Uh, and then, of course, blockchain application development work to partner with those guys also. Um, again, I like smarter. Urban data, manage urban data management is a smarter city offering. It's not the only city offering as part of this environment, but it's, man it's, all, it's all about some, you know, managing information in your community in baby steps. You know, again, don't build a high-tech, cool thing. Build what's appropriate to the community now. Use data as an enabler. It really is um, the secret to allowing you to be successful, understanding what's going on in the information. You already have it in your systems. You don't need to spend a lot of money on infrastructure or other tools to pull it into an environment to do analytics. We use open source technologies all over the place to make it free. You can do this. That's, when, that's how we get started. We use open source tools, cloud native tools, and they start very small. An interesting part about it is that the data is actually in many places. It's, it's in your own systems, it's in third party providers, whether it's a local provider, but it's also in national providers. So, you know, AT&T is a data source, potentially, for a digital community initiative. But so is, so is the local, local team that's doing traffic management. All those are part of the data ecosystem in an urban environment today. So let's talk about what San Jose is doing. San Jose, um, pretty, pretty, you know, big place, Silicon Valley. Um, they decided a few years ago they wanted to pursue the digital community model. And just by way of size, you know, um, 180 square miles, so very small by Alaskan standards. Um, 6,000 employees, you know, fair number of folks. They, they think that they have a lot of elevation in San Jose. So it is a little mountainous, I guess you could argue, but I would say probably not quite the same as here and other places. Um, but that's just some of the aspects of the city. Um, and the process they went through really came from the mayor 
in the city council. They said, we want to be a smart city, a digital communities player, but let's provide some guidance. So they stepped up to the plate and said, first, user-friendly. It has to be sustainable. This can't be just a one-off. Do a pilot. I get my blood statement on my campaign block flyer, and then I move on to the next office. No, this has to be something that's uh, meaningful and unique and relevant to the citizens over time. They have to be able to demonstrate it, show that it works, um, has to be safe, and has to be for citizens, not any one particular community or any particular uh, group with a bias. They used that, those five principles, and worked with the CIO, Rob Boyd, um, to say, we're going to champion the customer. We're going to be relentless about making sure the customer experience is useful, it's meaningful, it's relevant. We're going to learn. They're going to get the data. They're going to make sure they understand it. They're going to dissect it, apply what they learn, and improve it. And that's a digital process, of course. Uh, in terms of their architecture, they kind of divided it up this way. Um, we worked with a company called NTT on this one. Uh, in part, uh, they use a lot of open source tools. They use some of our equipment as well. But they really kind of said, OK, here we have an ecosystem. We have a platform. We have data architecture. And we have analytics. Those are the kind of four categories they lumped everything together in to create sort of what their platform would look like. They also then went through a process of saying, here's how we could use the data. Here's where it makes sense to consider using it. Not that we're going to do all these all at once, by any means. They started with traffic, and that's what I'm going to go through just a second. As part of their plan, they wanted to make sure they could plan for the future. So they saw data architecture as a hub, as a starting point. It's a, if you will, a hub and a spoke and a wheel model. They recognized, like in the earlier, earlier slide, that there's different providers of information, whether it's an Amazon or another cloud provider or themselves or AT&T, or a billing system, what have you. But they had an architecture that could scale and have an integration capability so that they could pull that data in as it, made, as it was relevant to the use case they were, performing, they were pursuing. Uh, they did data visualization, so they used Tableau and Microsoft Power BI, which is really, really hard to read. Um, and you can translate that, though, and we have GIS people in the room. You'll appreciate this one. So, as an example, they did a, did a application that simply analyzed the data to find where the predominant traffic problems were and where there were public safety results and then, you know, fatalities or, or uh, casualties, if you will. Then they said, OK, this is probably the percentage of where it's going to happen. Why don't we assign police officers to those areas? We have we deployed out tow trucks and ambulances into those areas where those things happened because they were able to figure out, you know, between these three hours on a day, where the problems were happening. Very simple example. Denver, for example, they, their first foray into the smart cities world was they put Wi-Fi on buses. Was a, the whole idea was to bridge the digital divide, make sure everybody had access to the internet in some form or fashion. Then they realized the buses were Wi-Fi enabled. They knew where the buses were. Then they said, wow, there's an accident over there. I'm going to drop the bus around that. I'm going to create an app that tells the user where the bus is going to be and when in a more accurate fashion, given traffic issues or given where, where there's accidents. So very baby steps to do all those things. Uh, they continue to do this today. They're analyzing uh, whether or not the, uh, the data points are actually helping things. And so there are places where they're seeing improvements and better response to an incident that happens and somebody gets to the hospital faster. They have a better chance of surviving if it's really serious. So just one example of where GIS and data can be used to affect public safety. So wrapping up here, just a convergence of major trends. We have Incremental computing is going down. The cost of computing is just getting lower. It'll never be zero because there's no such thing as free, right? I mean, we are in a, in a capitalistic society, right? So, um, uh, but the Internet of Things is growing. It's going to be huge. You saw some of the numbers that, that we're predicting. Um, the technology, I mean, Moore's Law is 18 months. 
you know, it might even be accelerated from that now. We're not really sure what the answer is, but it certainly feels like 18 months is a short period of time uh, given the advances today. It seems like it's every 12 months or something more evolutionary is coming out. And the cloud has certainly changed how people look at how they can deliver services and leverage computing power, whether it's storage or networking or computing. Um, that has changed how governments can think about how they operationalize themselves. Uh, like Tim talked about, the social media, social and mobile uh, evolution is huge. Um, and certainly all this relates to big data analytics and where all that's going. So those are some examples of where, you know, I talked about a couple of them where, you know, analytics are used as a way to help understand what's going on and to provide different and better citizen services. So you may say, where do I start? Solve a specific problem. Start small. No reason to go big. Uh, if you want to buy big from me, I'm happy to sell you something, but it's not necessary. It's really not. We don't actually try to sell anything and, in, the, in this world, we we're rely on our partners to do services with very small baby steps. That's our model. We figure over time, as you evolve, as you figure out what you want to do, then you know you'll get there. You'll go to the cloud. You go to somebody else. It doesn't matter. You'll pick a path that makes the most sense, and hopefully you plan for an architecture that allows you to scale as well. So you can grow into it as a reference, as opposed to buy it big and then try to fit it in and do it all at once, because that doesn't pay off. There are benefits, you know, architect for the future and pick a team that you know that you can trust and you can win with. That's it. Any questions? Was that good? <laughs> well, maybe I'll ask the same question as um, in uh, dealing with customers that you discovered the secret sauce <laughs> when approaching what is obviously a new investment with uh, a group of policymakers. You know, tell the story. I appreciate that. Uh, what is their um, uh, manufacturer financing? Are we talking about um, bonds of some kind? Or what have you seen that works? Uh, well, City, the San Diego Unified School District about five years ago uh, went through a process of passing a bond to do infrastructure improvements and system improvements. And they were able to spend about, it took them about 18 months to get that through. I think it was like in the neighborhood of $7 million. So that was one way they were able to put forward a financing model that allowed them to make changes over time. They didn't get all the money all at once. Um, it was managed by the city council, so they divvied it up over time. Everybody had to make business cases for how the money was spent. So that was one example of, of how that's been done. I think another place that's getting a lot more attention, even though it's not enough in terms of real funding, is cybersecurity. It's actually getting more attention when you start seeing that um, in large metro areas or even states, if there's a breach, CIO is fired. Simple as that. Uh, you know, Sony Pictures, not the best example, but you know, the buck stops there. That's just kind of how it works. Legislatures are not quite there in terms of providing the level of funding probably they should be, in my personal opinion. Um, uh, do they recognize it? I think some of them do, but it's sort of like one of those things until you're personally affected, it doesn't hit the mark as well. It's like, oh, they just stole the movie, yeah, whatever. No big deal, you know, they'll make another one, right? Um, so I think there's, there's a certain personal impact that needs to happen, and I don't say need to happen, I don't mean it that way. It just it will likely happen before people start getting more attention to it. So in some some cities and states, you'll see that they've been breached, they've had problems, and all of a sudden it's top of mind, and we're going to find a way to get some funding. Other places that haven't had that problem yet um, aren't quite adopting that model yet. Well, related to that, right? So is there uh, like a, a path? Is this, what, what's spurring this on? It sounds a for example, the other example you just provided, right? As far as uh, you know, I guess uh, demonstrating the burning bridge, for example. I mean, around here, try to get funding for security. It just doesn't happen until right. you have a massive breach, right? Right. right? But this is not just here. I mean, this has been happening in my career, right? Yeah, for the last five or six years. You're waiting yeah. for an event to happen. Yeah. 
before it gets any kind of attention. So on some of this, I'm not sure maybe there's an event that happened that maybe, well, you've seen maybe a lot of data analysis was kind of going on through some kind of uh, older method that says, well, here's, you know, so what led them to say, you know, to, to actually do a deep dive on the data on traffic accidents in San Jose, um, do, do you happen to know? Uh, well, so, have you been to San Jose? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, this is San Jose. Los Angeles. I used to uh, live there. It's yeah. the worst, it's yeah. the worst yeah. freeway. It's, 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 the, it's the worst traffic system in the world besides, yeah. well, Los Angeles, Tokyo, New York, <laughs> Dallas, Austin, Atlanta, Chicago. You just get out and walk. Right, yeah. right. Um, but it really came down from the, from the mayor and the city council. They said, we want to embrace this, this program. And they characterize it as a program as opposed to a project. So this had a more sustainable model of how they looked at it. Um, and they're also kind of going, well, you know, we're Silicon Valley. <laughs> it would look pretty bad if, you know, we didn't have Wi-Fi on our buses, much less know what's going on in terms of traffic patterns. So they picked traffic to start with, probably because it's easier, frankly. Uh, they had the data already, so it's easier to get to. Um, but they saw it again as a stepping stone. And they created, tried to create a vision of those five principles that gave them a model to work on the program over a period of time. So it really comes down to vision and interest in, in, you know, at, at a local government level, in my mind. Not all of them are interested. Just, and sometimes um, you know, smaller communities, the, the value prop doesn't, doesn't pencil out to them. Other ones, it does. You know, like I mentioned, City of Reno and City of Phoenix, they're embracing it fully. Maricopa County and Arizona is embracing it. City of Austin's embracing it, Chicago, City County Denver are embracing it, uh, Miami Dade's embracing it. So the larger ones are, are starting to do it. Uh, nationally, there's conferences every other week on smart cities or digital communities, how we describe it. I'm actually in Arizona doing another one of these um, Thursday. So that's, a, that's a, a linkage between City of Phoenix and Arizona State. So we're seeing that kind of collaboration as well. Well, it's interesting just about expectation settings that from the earlier presentation and then here, it's, uh, well, just like swim lessons, right? I was the guy three years ago standing in line, and I happened to be doing some work for Matt Sue at the time on e-commerce kind of business analysis. And I'm sitting here in line, and I've got every parent around me just happens to be talking about, I can't believe I can't do this on my phone, <laughs> right? And we're sitting in there for two hours to kind of line up. It's just like in the 70s. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of nostalgic in that way. Um, <laughs> well, so, that, so here we go. Is now it became quote. an expectation yeah. that we had to, that was one of the first services or the half a dozen that we have that we had to make sure we get back and up. Well, I'll leave you with an interesting, interesting quote. So the city of Boston says, if you need to come to the city hall, we're going to be here for you. If you have to come to city hall, we think. Right. Yeah. I think that's a great way to think about it. Thank you for your time. Thank uh you. -huh.